The Old Testament reading for this the sixth Sunday after the Epiphany is taken from the prophet Jeremiah, the seventeenth chapter. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who depends on flesh for his strength, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. He will be like a bush in the wastelands. He will not see prosperity when it comes. He will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. The blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. He will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when he comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. the Lord, all you nations, extol him, all you Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. 
Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their fathers treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who you laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you. For that is how their fathers treated the false prophets. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Hear again the word of the Lord. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is our faith. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Greetings to all of you, brothers and sisters in Christ, on this blessed sixth Sunday after Epiphany. This week we have quite the assortment of texts from Scripture, do we not? But as usual, they all fit together. Uh, today I'd like to begin with our epistle lesson. St. Paul writes, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is our faith. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. That's verse 14 and verse 20. This, brothers and sisters in Christ, is the very core of our Christian faith. At the heart of our religion stand two things. An occupied cross and an empty tomb. An occupied cross, wherein Jesus Christ hangs as the, uh, bearing the punishment for our sins. And an empty tomb, which Christ no longer resides in because he has conquered death and the grave. Here in our epistle lesson, St. Paul focuses on the empty tomb. Pointing out that if Christ has not been raised from the dead, then our entire religion is false. If Christ has not been raised from the dead, then he has not defeated death. If Christ has not been raised from the dead, then his sacrifice has not been accepted by God the Father. Therefore, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, then we have no hope of the resurrection, no hope that our sins are forgiven. He is risen. These three simple words, which the entirety of our faith rests upon. If these three words are false, then our religion is false. If, however, they are true, then our religion is true. Very few religions make such a claim. For example, Buddhism. It doesn't stand or fall based on whether Buddha was a real person who lived. And for that matter, most religions don't rely on historical claims at all but rather on a very pragmatic question. Does it work? Does a religion give you the results you want? Does it give you what you ask for? If your God blesses you with material happiness, well, then that must be the true God, the right religion. But what does Jesus say to us this morning? He says the exact opposite. Our gospel lesson comes from Luke 6, uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Plain, which has uh, parallels with the Mount, Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, Blessed are you who are poor. Blessed are you who hunger. Blessed are you who weep. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil. Christ's promise here is not that it will all work out for your material happiness. The truth of the Christian faith rests not on does it work, but he is risen. In fact, Christ promises a lot of times it won't work out now. But those three words change everything, don't they? He is 
risen. Let us look again at, what's, uh, what, at what Jesus says in the light of his resurrection. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who, are hung who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you, and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their fathers treated the prophets. He is risen. Christ has been raised from the dead, and that means that your material needs now will be met in the resurrection. Because Christ is risen from the dead, your hunger will be satisfied when you feast at the marriage supper of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Because Christ is risen from the dead, your every tear will be wiped away on the last day by Christ himself. Because Christ is risen from the dead, we do not need to worry about the opinions of unbelievers of their persecution, or their threats, or of our own reputation. Every idle word that is spoken against God and against the church by pagans will ultimately be brought to justice on the last day. This is what Jesus is beginning to change our minds about these things. Because we know, ultimately, our reward is in heaven, not here on earth. Jesus has simple words for us, comforting us. He wishes us to know that the world's measures of success, its values, these are false. In this dying world, we are often poor, hungry. We often mourn and are reviled for Christ's sake, just as his prophets always have been throughout all generations. Yet we know that Christ's sure promise is founded upon his own death and his resurrection. Ultimately, he promises that you will be made whole in the resurrection. We truly will be those who are blessed on the last day. Jesus continues. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are fed, well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for that is how their fathers treated the false prophets. Woe is not exactly a word we encounter very often in common speech, is it not? But we see it all over the scriptures. When you see this word in the Bible, you need to know that whoever is described in this next statement, better watch out, because God's wrath will be quickly coming upon them. The Psalms and the prophets use this, use this word quite often. Here, Jesus continues to change our perspective about material blessings. He, he encourages us to see these things differently, to see them as things that can lead us away from the faith and the hope that is to come. He warns the rich man, he better watch out, because his riches here on earth may be the only comfort he has. We see all over the Bible, there are so many words spoken about wealth and to, and to the rich. Many words of warning. Most notably are the misquoted words of St. Paul. You've probably heard the love, that the money is the root of all evil. Right? Well, that's not exactly what it says. St. Paul writes in 1 Timothy 6, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. St. Paul wishes us to know the danger of pursuing wealth above God. That this thing can lead us away from the faith. 
Jesus writes, uh, Jesus speaks in the parable of the sower of those who receive the word of God, yet their faith is destroyed by the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. Wealth often is able to lead us away from Christ when we place wealth above the blessings that Christ actually wants to give us. One of the chief examples of this is children. Children are often spoken of as financial burdens. Of the dollars and cents expended from age zero to 18, or maybe in our, in our time, 20 or 25, <laughs> of the opportunity costs lost as mom spends time at home nursing a child. Of the expensive colleges that we need to spend, send our children to in order to maximize their paycheck someday. But see what all of these things have done. We see the real blessing, children, and instead we pursue wealth, riches instead. Money is a tool, not an ultimate purpose in life. We see here that the, the pursuit of wealth ultimately will lead to an empty life. Because in the short term, right, wealth brings security. It brings contentment. There's certain things you don't have to worry about if the bank account has enough zeros. But there is no bank account on earth that will comfort you at your deathbed. Wealth is not something to be pursued above all else. Likewise, Jesus warns those who go forth fully satisfied and content with their life as it is. For they, they find themselves full now, but Jesus warns them that they will hunger and thirst at the final judgment. See, in this life there are those who find themselves lacking nothing, and they are complacent. To this group belong many agnostics today in our world who believe in some kind of God, but they don't care to look into it much further because their life is going pretty good right now. Jesus' third woe is against those who laugh. And he isn't simply speaking about the act of laughter, but rather of scoffing. That is, those who laugh at God and at Christ. The scoffer is one of the main characters in the Old Testament wisdom literature, especially the book of Proverbs. The scoffer is a modern atheist, laughing at the idea that God would become man in order to die upon the cross, laughing at, the, at all kinds of things that Scripture holds dear. The, the, uh, the mocker laughs at the one true God and at his followers. But ultimately, Jesus points out, God will have the final laugh. But Jesus' word, final words here in our gospel lesson are especially poignant in this season of epiphany as we consider what it is to live around people who do not believe in our God. Jesus says, Woe to you when all men speak well of you. For that is how their fathers treated the false prophets. In the Old Testament, especially in the time of Jeremiah, there were many false prophets in the land. They spoke the words of the king. Uh, they spoke words to the king and the people that they wanted uh, that they wanted to hear. Namely, they told the king and the people that God was happy with them. Meanwhile, the true prophets, Jeremiah among them, had a very different message to share with Judah. God is coming in wrath to punish sin. In our lesson today, we see the warning that Jeremiah gives. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who depends on flesh for his strength, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. Jeremiah didn't make very many friends or influence very many people with these words. But they were important. And they were the words that God gave him to preach to the people. And he was hated by many, and especially by the king, and spent many, much of his ministry 
in per, uh, being persecuted by the king for his message. Meanwhile, the false prophets in the land, they were beloved by all, for they always had happy and cheerful messages to preach. God loves you. He isn't wrathful in the slightest. This is their chief message. These prophets were respectable people. They never got in trouble with the king, and they were beloved by all the people. They laughed at the idea of God's wrath and of his justice. They were well-fed and held comfortable positions of power in Judah. We see, it, uh, we see ultimately they have their reward it's already been given to them, but they will be judged on the last day. Meanwhile, those who confess that he is risen are often treated badly. The earliest Christians, including many of those who personally saw Jesus resurrected in the body, many of these men and women went to their deaths at the hands of the Romans, confessing that Christ is risen. The Jews and the Romans hated these three words because if they were true, well, for the Romans, this would mean their entire religion was false. And for the Jews, this would mean that they had crucified their Messiah. And so both the Jews and the Romans preferred simply to kill the Christians rather than deal with these possibilities. Christians in all generations go to their graves with this confession. He is risen. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He is the first fruits, and we are the second fruits. He has been raised from the dead, and so too shall we be raised from the dead. In the face of all discomfort and suffering and threats in this life, let us join together in the Easter confession. He is risen. He is, he is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus.